Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good break. This next session is titled Trust Your Doctor, Securing Trust in the Healthcare System. How does this help to drive access and equity? Nearly every health organization recognizes that we must make adjustments to put the individual at the center of healthcare. And in order to have this person tap into the health system and receive the support they need for prevention and sick care, they must have trust in the system. Now, as a reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and our moderator will address them at the end of the session. Now, let me pass the, pass the session over to Maya Bortmanis, General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer at Zolig Pharma, to help us learn more about what it takes to establish trust in a healthcare ecosystem. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to this uh, great event. And I'd like to um, warmly welcome our three panellists, Gareth Lee, uh, Campbell Clark and uh, Redentor Ramiro. I've known each of these gentlemen for many years. All of them have um, super legal compliance experience. Gareth is the current General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer of Cordis, a former uh, GC of Cardinal Health and also came from AstraZeneca. Gareth and I have probably known each other for far too long to reveal our age. Um, Campbell is the uh, current General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer of Medtronic. I believe Campbell... Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific. Um, and Campbell has been in his role in various permutations for 18 years and is also the Vice Chair of Ad, uh, Ad, APEC, APEC um, uh, the medical device organisation. And Redentor Ramiro, who has just recently joined Zulig Pharma, um, has uh, been uh, in working in a legal and compliance capacity for about uh, 18 years and came to us from Vivor Pharma, and so we're delighted to have you all. So, as, you. so as Tony indicated, um, the theme of today's presentation, we have uh, uh, experts from legal ethics and compliance. It's all about trust. Trust is a small but mighty word. Um, indeed, you know, meaningful relationships in healthcare are fundamentally built on trust. Patients need to trust industry and organisations, um, uh, relationships, uh, and, and um, our, our clients who depend upon integrity in the supply chain need to trust reliability, quality, and compliance. When trust is broken, um, things can go terribly pear-shaped and um, clearly systems can break down. So it's critically important for all um, stakeholders within industry to uh, uphold um, trusting relationships and all, always bear in mind that we're really working for the patients here and we're really um, ultimately focused on providing access affordability and quality products to those patients who need them. So we've got a couple of questions and I will turn at times to um, uh, questions coming in from the floor so I encourage each of you to ask those questions and I'll monitor the chat board but um, turning first to um, uh, Gareth, uh, with our theme of trust you know, in your view, what creates trusting relationships, particularly in this industry of life sciences being highly regulated? Well, I think, I think that's, a, that's a huge question. Um, and there are many ways to look at it. Uh, but I think in a nutshell, the way uh, I would answer it would be that um, the way we create trust is to do the right thing even when nobody's watching, right? I think that's, that's how um, someone who's much wiser than me, uh, uh, described integrity, and I think in a nutshell, that's it. I think um, if, if we look at what has happened in the last two and a half years with, with COVID and, and the lockdowns and the massive disruptions that it has caused to, to our daily lives, I think one of the guiding principles that healthcare companies like ours should ask ourselves, and I think many of us did ask ourselves, is what's the right thing to do at this moment um, when, when all hell has broken loose, right? When supply chains are disrupted, when hospitals are filled, when people are just crying out for medical products, do we jack up the price? Do we gouge the market? Or do we put patients at the center of all we do? 
I think many of us have in our various companies, you know, our, our, our values, our mission statement and, and, and things like that, uh, our vision. And I think all these revolve around um, being patient-centric, being, being a physician-centric, uh, doing the right thing, putting an emphasis on, on the quality of our products. And I think it would, be a, it, it would be a shame to let a good crisis go to waste. So I think if, if companies uh, are guided by their values and did the right thing, I think that that would be a great reflection on us and that would help generate that trust that we need uh, for our products from, from our key stakeholders. Another uh, thing that, that um, I would, on reflection, think that we ought to do is that we, oftentimes, I think many large companies like ours uh, tend to look inwardly for points of reference, you know, for, for codes of conduct, our values, and, and, and these are all good things. Uh, but one of the things that I think we, we, we can certainly look as an opportunity is to look outwards as well to look at what are some of the other stakeholders that govern our industry, the external regulators, uh, patient groups, um, other industry members. How do we fare compared to them? I mean, um, on, on a bell curve, um, what, what is the, the standards of our quality uh, and, and, and how we are perceived in the industry? So one of the things that I would, I would actually um, think and, and recommend that we all reflect on carefully is that you know how we can take external points of reference, uh, join an industry group like APEC Med or, or Advamed or whatever it is, um, talk to patients respectfully, have those interactions with, with, with patient groups, and also listen to regulators, what they are telling us about what, how they, they perceive the quality of our products, the accessibility of our products, the pricing of our products, uh, in the marketplace. I mean, obviously, we are not a charity. We're a for-profit organization, but there is a balance that we need to draw. And I think uh, uh, it, it, it requires us to, to have that maturity and that judgment to make the right call. No, thank you, Gareth. Really interesting thoughts. And Campbell, how about yourself um, when we're talking about building trusting relationships in industry and how we can demonstrate that? Uh, look, thanks, Myron. Um, Gareth has uh, covered uh, a lot of it. I, I guess my perspective is, uh, and Gareth has just said it, you put the patients first and work back from there. Um, ultimately, that can inform better decision making. I think a lot of uh, uh, people go into the life sciences because you know, they, they aspire to work for enterprises that actually really benefit people. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, if, if that starts driving decisions uh, internally within the company, uh, then uh, you know, ultimately there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a greater good that is served. Um, so putting patients first and thinking, well, you know, uh, in terms of whether you're in a healthcare company, the role you play, what are, what are the things that you really need to focus on? And so oftentimes if you're uh, you know, looking at, uh, say, commercial issues, Okay, there's a there's a commercial upside. You, 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 as Gareth said, uh, we're in business to uh, make a fair profit. But at the end of it, we're going to be successful if we put our customers first, our patients first, uh, and then uh, you know that that starts to inform better decision making. I think I, I quite like the point about organisations being somewhat internally focused, and they are. Uh, equally, though, uh, just recognising that um, you know whether you're in medical devices or pharma or diagnostics, uh, you're part of the so-called ecosystem uh, and everyone has a part to play and everyone can get a share of the pie. Um, I think one of the other um, uh, I, you know, real opportunities is for uh, industry uh, to work together to just increase access to uh, viable healthcare treatments. I mean, there's so much innovation, there is so much, uh, there's so much good still to be done um, and I think we have a greater chance of, um, I think, achieving better health outcomes for a broader um, uh, constituency uh, if industry works together, works with their, collaborate in appropriate ways uh, in order to um, you know, sort of drive some common objectives. Um, the industry associations in the medical device industry, for example, uh, we had last week, it was the APEC Med MedTech Forum, it was all about the patient. And it's good to, I think, for industry to just recenter. That's why we're in business. That's what we're doing. 
Uh, and you, you need the healthy competition because innovation is key. Uh, at the end of it, I think expectations are going up in terms of uh, what solutions or, or, or treatments or diagnoses that you know, can, can be um, uh, made available. That cost, that, you know, there's an enormous investment required. So that's where sort of engaging with you know, those outside of the industry in terms of things like affordability, uh, who do you partner with in order to, um, you, you know, whether it's um, uh, the innovation and in products and services, uh, or just deploying those products and services to a, uh, to a greater group. Uh, and engagement with government, of course. Uh, you know, at the end of it, we're trying to achieve the same objective, uh, which is improving healthcare outcomes. And I think things are challenging now because governments are squeezed. Uh, in the last, I guess, two and a half years, managing COVID, um, you know, healthcare budgets are, you know, have been decimated. Mm. Um, so it seems now more than ever, uh, industry needs to work with government, needs to work with uh, you know, patient groups, uh, physician groups, uh, in order to start to work out strategies in order to you know, improve health outcomes, uh, you know, across. Uh, multiple geographies, all with their own separate challenges. Because the last point I'll make is, um, you know, con by country, the challenges are different. The mm -hmm. systems are different. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, think of Southeast Asia, there's no real commonality mm -hmm. in terms of how these issues are addressed. And I think there is an opportunity for industry to work with governments to, you know, maybe uh, smooth the regulatory pathway. Um, the time to market for certain therapies. I mean, there are very good reasons why you need strong regulation. But again, if, if a, a bigger cohort can be can benefit from treatment or you know, what it, whatever it might be, shortening those approval times uh, is critical. And then I think uh, you know where issues arise, there always arise, there are always problems uh, that we get onto those really quickly uh, and uh, and work to resolve those. So I think there's a huge opportunity. Uh, I don't think it's going to work for us if industry stays siloed uh, mm. and just competes as industry. I think we just need to start engaging a whole lot more with uh, other stakeholders. No, absolutely. I think COVID has taught the world many things and it's interesting to look at or reflect upon um, the Asian experience. Um, it's fair to say that many Asian, uh, you know, regulators acted very quickly to protect their communities and, uh, dare I say, imposed some pretty strident restrictions, but we've come out of it. So, Red, turning to yourself, you know, on this issue of trusting relationships. Yeah. So, they, they raise very good points. In fact, I was nodding because some of the points they raise are also the things that I've been thinking about. I'd like to pick some of the points raised by Gareth and also Campbell. Um, so, I think, if you think about it, uh, trust, right? Um, we're, we're looking at, and, and what Garrett said about you know, being patient-centric, being physician-centric. So these are the two groups that, are, that we are looking to to make sure that they have trust in terms of our industry, in the pharma industry. And I think there are two levels that you have to take a look at here. One would be the individual level. So we have to have quality engagements with physicians. Mm. So we're physician-centric. And we have to have quality engagements or and quality information provided to patients as well. But the other level would be in terms of the group. So there are medical associations, for example. Um, and I think to the point raised by Campbell, um, or we shouldn't be siloed because most of the time we're siloed. We work with our pharma uh, pharmaceutical industry association. We work internally, as pointed out by, by Garrett. But I think we have to have more interaction with medical associations because if you take a look at what they're doing, they have their own, they have their own code of conduct. Mm -hmm. They're also trying to build trust with patients. So I think if both pharmaceutical industry associations and medical associations work together, then I think we're able to um, cover more ground in terms of building trust. And if we're thinking of patients, um, and, and I'm, I'm speaking now as a, as a patient myself. We're all patients, right? So whenever you are prescribed a drug, normally if it's a, a standard drug, so for example, if you're talking about cholesterol, high blood pressure, which I take, um, you don't really give much thought to it, right? But if it's a new disease, you actually do your research, right? You, you want to figure out, okay, what are the treats, treatments that are available? 
which, which goes to the quality of the information that we provide. Because there is now, as we all know, you know, information, the quality of information is not readily available if you just Google it. If you just Google it, you might come up with information that are not actually very accurate, not very good. So I think we need to do a better job with disseminating quality information, right, for disease, uh, especially for patients, but also for our products, for our physicians. So I think looking at both levels, levels, uh, the individual level, the, the individual physicians, and what information will be uh, available to patients, uh, and also in, in the group level, in the industry associations and the patient group. So I think we have to take a look at those two levels when we're talking about building trust. No, thank you. Actually, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, and I'd like it to pause and, and address this to you all. Very interesting. Today, the issue of non-compliance impacting trust and quality health care lies more with non-compliant players than it does within compliant organisations, which already have very strong systems in place. Assuming that we must play a role in driving higher standards in the markets where we operate in partnership with governments, what next steps do we need to encourage and really focus on? Big question, very interesting question, thank you. Can I go first? Please. So, so I, I think there is some, some truth to, to that comment in, in, in some markets. And what, what I have seen is that um, um, companies that are not shy of calling out non-compliant behaviors and dubbing them into the regulators, right? I've, I've seen that in some markets, such as in, in Korea, uh, in, in, in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, in, in, even in China, right? So, so we, we've got cultures and markets where that competition is very hot. So just calling out non-compliant behaviors and, and, and just pulling in the regulators, and again, you know, that comes to my, to my earlier point about taking reference from external points of, of data. I think that's, that's what drives this, and I would encourage all of us that if, if we have... Um, seen instances, uh, then, then I, I think that's an action that we, we, we ought to take. But then one of the things that uh, we should also caution ourselves is that if we call out someone's bad behaviour, we need to make sure that we are also clean in the way uh, we, are, we are conducting ourselves in the market. Any other? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Often this topic comes up, you've got large organisations, big compliance programs, and then you've got smaller players who don't play by the same rules. That's a, uh, a frequent uh, observation. However, um, at the end of it, and to Gareth's point, you call out bad behaviour, you need to make sure your house is in order. And I do think a risk is with a lot of compliance programs, um, on paper they look terrific. Mm -hmm. And a lot is invested and there are a lot of people involved. But if underpinning... Uh, decision making is not you know, a culture of integrity and doing the right thing by patients and by customers, uh, then no matter how elaborate your compliance program is, uh, you're not going to actually uh, escape responsibility. Um, I do think there is obviously a huge um, role for regulators to play uh, in regulating the space. Because at the end of it, when you think of what non-compliant activity in the healthcare sector, what, what happens then? So if it's uh, in, inappropriate inducements to uh, a healthcare professional, how does that translate to better patient care? It probably doesn't. It means that the physician is potentially conflicted in treating their patient. So I think we just have to take a step back. Why do we have the compliance program? What, what, what's, the, what's the rationale for it? And it's not just ticking boxes and, and you know, we have to follow the rules. Some people are very, you know, they're fine with that, but at the end of it, there's a bigger problem to be addressed, and that is that patients should get uh, unbiased, um, you know, frank um, uh, advice and, and, and treatment options from their physician, take a step back. Uh, when physicians are interacting with industry, with a pharma, diagnostics or devices, their purchasing decisions have to be made for the right reasons. Um, so that's, that's why we have the program. Um, you know, small companies, big companies, they're all susceptible to the same temptations and the same risks. Um, and uh, again, uh, another plug for industry associations. 
The idea is to be more inclusive, bring in the smaller companies, uh, explain why it's good for industry to follow uh, a common code of uh, ethical conduct. No, thank you, Campbell. And, and Brett, yeah, did you? I just wanted to share. So I, I think it's a good point. Um, when we come together in an industry association, right, and usually the meetings, uh, there are certain sort of like, for example, if there's a violation, that's usually called out. And, and the reason for that is sometimes because of, you know, you're looking at how your competitor is promoting, for example, and you have issues to that. But one thing that we have, we have not done a lot is to actually share good practices with each other. Um, and of course, there, there are certain questions that we have to hurdle. So for example, we have to be sure that there's nothing anti-competitive with what we're sharing. But in terms of good practices with compliance, with you know, you know, how, how we actually manage the quality of uh, the information and the quality of interactions we have with, with um, uh, physicians as well, and with the, industry, with the associations of physicians, I think we can do more. It's more, it, it could be more on training, it could be more in terms of like, like we do with conferences. We share how we actually properly manage compliance, you know, how we do engagements with physicians. So I think once we have more interactions within the industry association in terms of best practices, and then sort of like share that and work together with medical associations, that's actually when you get more positive news, you know, positive uh, movement in, ter in terms of like how we do uh, compliance in the pharma industry and not focus on violations. Can, can I just pick up on that? So um, well, this is about four years ago, uh, the industry association APEC Med for Medical Devices for Asia Pacific determined that we would no longer directly sponsor uh, HCPs to third party conferences. Uh, and so that was really controversial. It was controversial within APEC Med. Uh, not all companies were necessarily aligned. And, and certain companies decided we're not going to join APEC Med because we want to continue to sponsor direct, uh, doctors direct. Not that uh, you know, necessarily that is a compliance violation in itself. It's not. Um, but it's that, um, I guess, impression that doctors could be unduly influenced. Now, what we did not do when we changed, we, we, were, we got to a a common consensus within the industry association, but where I think we dropped the ball was uh, engaging with physician groups. And so we, we probably embarked on that a little late in the day, uh, because from the physician groups, it's, well, you're just uh, you're being cheap. Uh, you're, you're taking something away. Education is important. We don't disagree with any of that. Uh, but we didn't engage them early enough. So engaging with physician groups, uh, and probably, I think, in terms of ethics and integrity, you know, a bigger component Correct. of training for yeah. healthcare professionals. I think that's really important. And, and I think we have to do more of that because otherwise, we're always second guessing what doctors would think. Yeah. Right. And because we're talking about individual doctors, when we talk about it, we think about, oh, doctor so and so is not going to appreciate that. But if we if we interact with the medical association so that they're sort of like their leadership we can align with them, I think we can get better traction instead of like working in silo as a pharma industry, thinking about you know, how we're going to interact with physicians individually without actually having a, an, you know, an, an avenue so that we can actually have free flow of discussions between both groups. So, so really, I mean, the theme that's running through all of this, you know, many companies, certainly the companies that we interact with and work for, have, you know, robust systems in place that are really, um, you know, self-functioning, where we're trying to self-regulate. Uh, and, of course, doctor associations, they also have their codes of conduct. Um, and ultimately, governments are the, the regulator and the oversight authority, so they have a responsibility to ensure there's a levy, level playing ground. Um, so there's a lot of responsibility within four players to self-regulate. There's an interesting comment that uh, dovetails nicely into your thoughts, uh, Campbell and Red. How much should the compliance responsibility and accountability be placed on doctors and not just companies? Very good question. So I think you already um, mentioned the answer there, Maya. Um, doctors have their code of conduct. Now, to be honest, I don't know how they're actually doing training around that, communicating and promoting that. I don't know. Uh, but at least from the pharma industry side, we know that we've been working on this for decades, right? So we do have certain good practices on how to do that. And going back to the point of you know, having more interactions with you know, these physician associations, 
if we're able to share how we actually do the training, how we do the embedding of the culture within our organizations, maybe that could actually benefit the side of the physicians as well. Maybe there's something that we can share to them. I don't know, maybe they're doing things better than, than we are, so we can mm -hmm. learn from them as well. So I think <clears throat> unless we have that interaction, we, we don't really know. I, I think to, to Red's point, um, as I sort of like cast my mind across the whole region, every single medical association that I'm aware of in the region has CME events for their physicians, continuous medical education events, right? And, and these topics vary um, very widely. One opportunity I think that we have as an industry is probably to sort of like interact with, with uh, these um, uh, medical associations to, to talk about ethics and, and, and integrity and to explain why we do certain things as an industry. Like for example, if we cut back on, on individual sponsorships for third party events, I think we need to explain to them why that's not uh, a decision made by, by companies lightly or because of, of uh, budgetary constraints, but because we are protecting patients, we are putting them first, we are trying to uh, maintain that sanctity of that relationship between physician and patient, right? Help them understand the rationale so that, that uh, we don't get pressured from, from doctors, oh, why are you not giving us this or that anymore? And explain to them the various other avenues that we are actually providing to them in a way that is more insulated from all these bad influences, uh, that is more objective, that we're still funding their, their education and training simply because we want better clinical outcomes, we, we, we want improved patient safety, but we want to do it in a way that trains, that, that, that floats, floats all ships, that, that provides that education to all doctors and not just selected KOLs. Um, so, so I think that's an opportunity for us to interact more with medical associations. Just, I, I totally agree, and I think just a comment before um, I move to the next question. I think you know we've all seen in our careers there's been a, a sea change uh, within companies. Mature companies now realise that it, it's not actually useful uh, as a value proposition to you know provide lots of individual benefits to you know, individual doctors. It's far more useful to, to provide, um, you know, charitable contributions or, say, grants to associations or doctor groups or patient organisations, those, those that benefit uh, many rather than a few. Um, and that's where the industry is moving to, and I think that's a good sign. So just on that, um, the next question, which I will turn to Campbell. Um, so. Pursuant to that type of sea change in, in how industry is responding, uh, responding to you know, ethical, more transparent interactions, what are some other best practices that industry and governments and um, you know, stakeholders alike can adopt to embed trust in the healthcare system? Thanks, Mike. Look, I, I mean, I do think it's, it's easy to say, okay, well, let's engage with physician groups, we absolutely need to do that. Patient groups, we need to do that. We need to um, you know, educate sort of the up and coming uh, healthcare professionals as to why doing business the right way is the right thing to do. You can't, um, to me, abdicate responsibility from within organizations to do things in the right way. To, re to re really be introspective about, I think across the board, patient, uh, um, physician interactions and how each individual, you know, as a company, uh, you engage with your customer base. Uh, I think too often, you, you know, you, you think, well, it can't be a race to the bottom, right? It can't be, well, everyone else is doing it, so we continue to do it. And when we're told not to do it, and it could be a, like a mandatory code of ethics, or it could be a, a regulation, as you, we have in some jurisdictions. Uh, in some ways, uh, I think there is a real part to be played by, you know, key um, you know, companies, institutions within the industry to actually kind of set the higher bar. Um, I also question how much innovation there has really been when it comes to training and education on products and therapies. Um, so, you know, again, going back to 2020 when a lot of things shifted online, a lot of training and education is online. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that is a far more effective way to disseminate training to, for, uh, to a far uh, greater audience uh, than the traditional way of doing it, which was inviting doctors to a, 
maybe a third-party conference or your own event. So I think um, we need to, you know, to Gareth's point, not waste the crisis and, uh, and just think about, well, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to educate on available therapies, available treatments, available products. Um, so online, I think, is a pretty effective way of doing that. Uh, and then, look, in the devices space, you cannot get away from hands-on training. That's required for certain procedures. But much better, probably, to do that in country, mm. in an institution, a clinical setting, mm. uh, than you know, what I think industry has defaulted to, which is um, send, send doctors away to a, to a training center. So I, I think there is a shift taking place uh, and it's gotta be within you know, key players within the industry, just maybe you know, setting the standard and then sharing that, sharing the best practices within industry groups. Um, and um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, otherwise, otherwise I, I fear we just go back to where we were um, pre-pandemic um, with this tussle around, well, okay, you know, uh, how can we accommodate travel? How do we facilitate grants? Is it through an institution? Is it through an association? That doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Mm. Absolutely. And Gareth? Yeah, so, so you know there's this famous saying that um, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day, right? So, so I think the same thing is true about, about processes uh, that, that uh, um, culture eats processes and, and policies and procedures for, for breakfast every day. So, you know, in the, in the ethics and, and integrity business that we're in, I don't think that we can have enough policies, procedures and, 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 and principles to, to guide a company. If we relied solely on that, no compliance organization is big enough. <laughs> So what we need is actually a culture of compliance. And what does that mean? I mean, a culture is actually built from, from, from habits. And, and how do you acquire those habits? You measure them, because whatever gets measured gets done. Right? So, so one of the things that I'm, I'm quite proud of in, in my organization and, and also you know, the organization before this is that we put, as part of the performance scorecard, a quality matrix and a compliance matrix for everyone in the organization, from the CEO all the way down. So it's right across the organization, right? So, so our, our quality policy is actually a very simple one, and I think it's something that, that all of us can resonate with, uh, especially, you know, what Red said about all of us are patients. Um, you know, our, policy cal our, our quality cal uh, policy is that to make products that we would be confident and proud of to use on our family. It's as simple as that. So what do you do? And, and we, we have specific items that we expect everyone in the organization to, to, to do and be measured against at the end of the year or at every quarter when you have that, that, that performance discussion with your manager, right? Uh, things like, have you done your trainings on time? Um, I, I've seen GMs who are just so enamored of this new culture that I, I was actually, it, it pleased me no end. Uh, it, to, to see my China GM do the compliance training, as in lead the compliance training, lead the, the compliance presentation, together with my compliance head for China. So you know, the, it's, it's one thing to see the, the compliance director giving a compliance presentation. It's quite another thing to see the GM do it, right? So because I, the whole organization can see that what's important to her is important to me. So I think to, to make sure that we build a culture of compliance within the organization beats having a, a hundred policies and procedures. So I think we need to do what we can to build that, that, that within our DNA and becomes part of our moral compass. So I'd just like to pause there and say, during this session, there have been lots of thumbs up and quite a few hearts, dare I say. So this looks like the K-pop compliance team <laughs> in action. Uh, Red, your thoughts on embedding trust in healthcare? Yeah, so I, I want to build on what um, Garrett mentioned because I've had that before. Um, and I'm sure you've seen that as well. If your head of business always talks about compliance, the entire leadership team and their staff would be acting in accordance with the tone. Because otherwise, if, if compliance is mentioned as just, oh, so that I don't forget, compliance, 
you know, if it's sort of like just a message on the side, it doesn't deliver as, uh, as clearly as when they actually take time to talk about it. So I've had a, a head of business who actually always mentions that if ever I am being asked to do something that is inappropriate by a partner, um, then I'm willing to walk away, as simple as that. And that sends a message to commercial, to everyone else that, okay, that is the standard. Because to your point, Garrett, even if we have very, very wonderful policies, if the boss doesn't actually um, uh, deliver that message, those policies are not gonna get read. Mm -hmm. So it's important that they hear it. So I wanted, to, I wanted to just share that as well because I've had the same experience. But also in terms of like the best practices, and I, and I think Campbell has mentioned some of that, uh, we shouldn't waste a good crisis, as mentioned by uh, Garrett. Um, there's a lot of new practices, not best practice, but new practices that came about because of COVID. A lot of that is online. And going back to being a patient myself, and everyone's a patient, everyone listening here is a patient, we all use you know, online tools to get information. And it goes back to having good quality information available. And that's still a question to me. Where do I actually find good quality information as a patient? As a doctor, maybe there are good quality information that can be provided by pharma companies, uh, but I don't know for, for those diseases that are, for example, not as properly uh, promoted or um, communicated by the pharma companies. Uh, so where, where do the, these doctors get those quality information from online? So as mentioned by, by Campbell, before COVID, it's, it's like live meetings but now we do have other forms. There's multimedia, right? There's actually a, a, a very in-demand role right now on multimedia promotion, right? So I, I think there's more to see around that in the coming years, just because we've done things differently in the past two years. So thank you. Now we're heading into the home straight, and I want you, um, you know, to tie up all your fantastic thoughts. You know, what are one or two things that industry and, and government can and should do to prevent a breach of trust with the patient's rights in mind? And Red, you can skip yeah. us off, um, off here. I think we have laws, we have industry codes, we have internal codes, um, and all we need to do is to actually properly implement them and enforce them, right? So from a government perspective, they have the laws. From an industry perspective, we have industry codes. From, from uh, individual pharma companies, we have our own internal codes. So if we were to actually work together, because the principles in all those codes are similar, basically do not bribe. Mm -hmm. Make sure that when a doctor prescribes the medicine, um, it is not tainted because of a, an undue influence that was impressed upon him. So if we work with government, if we work with you know, medical associations, as we've been talking about uh, for the past few minutes, uh, to talk about those principles and maybe work together in terms of like promoting it positively, but also enforcing it. Because at the end of the day, um, sometimes you do need strong enforcement uh, to be able to curb inappropriate practice. And, and now I think it's more important just because everyone is on social media. So everyone sees what's happening. So if there's something inappropriate happening, for example, between a pharma company and a, a physician, and it's on social media, everybody else sees that. So that breaks down the trust. So it's important that each stakeholder, government, industry associations, pharma companies, and maybe working with the patient groups, work together uh, to promote positive um, actions and interactions, but also enforce. I think that's very important. And some last thoughts, Ken? Yeah, I couldn't agree. I could not agree more on the enforcement. So across Asia Pacific, there are multiple codes, regulations in place to prevent bribery and corruption. Uh, but I think there is almost a calculus done within industry as to which the jurisdictions where there's going to be enforcement. And where there's strong enforcement, uh, uh, you know, behavior tends to align uh, in accordance with the code, the regulation, the law, the expectations. Uh, where enforcement is lax, it becomes like a risk rating exercise. That can't continue. So at the end of it, governments need to enforce uh, the frameworks they've put in place. Second, I would suggest that uh, ultimately, and, and we've said it before, it's tone from the top. It's leadership. 
We have to, I think, hold leaders to higher standards of ethics and compliance mm -hmm. than necessarily we do. Uh, it seems to me we're very clear uh, about the boundaries when it's someone who maybe doesn't matter, someone lower down in the organisation. Uh, but the debate that you end up having if it's someone who's a, a key contributor, a, a strong performer, but charged with an ethical breach, uh, there's a whole lot more latitude, it seems to me, to be given to those people. My thinking is you don't get the right tone from the top unless they're held to the highest standard. Absolutely. And, and Gareth, I, I would invite you to, to make some comments. Right. So, so um, I, I like what Red and um, Campbell talked about, about um, holding people to higher standards. Um, I, I want to address that, that other part of your question about access to health care and to make sure that, that, that patients uh, get the, the treatment that they need. Right. I, I think that's, that's very important uh, and it's a key critical component to build trust in this industry because I mean, if we are pricing everything too high and people are not getting access to, to the treatments they need, uh, that doesn't reflect well on us as an organisation and us as, as an industry. So I think what we need to do and like, what I'd like to see is a holistic get-together between governments, and every player in the healthcare industry from, from distributors like, like Zuilik to, to medical uh, device manufacturers to, to drug manufacturers to patient groups to, to physician groups to identify the top three or five disease states that a society must tackle within the next five years, right? And, and get these priorities out there and, so that, and, and shine a bright spotlight on that so that everybody agrees and, and understands what the healthcare priorities of that country are. And, and actually sort of get our act together and to make sure that we solve that and to, and to bring tangible results to, to, to the patients that we serve. So I think that's, that's one way that, that we can show our value to, the, to, to society and, and the communities that, that we, we serve and, and, and live in. And I think that's, that's, that's an opportunity that, that I, I don't see uh, very much anywhere in the world, not just in Asia. I mean, it's like sometimes you have government affairs, uh, public policy, health economics groups talking to the, someone in the Department of Health, uh, but that sort of smells of lobbying and, and you know, lobbying sort of creates an impression that isn't necessarily positive. Um, so I, I think if, if we sort of shine a bright spotlight on that and have a whole, whole of industry approach with the government and, 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 and sort of let the public know uh, you know, what are the priorities and how we intend to deal with these problems, uh, I think, I think that would be a marvellous thing. Thank you so much. And thank you for those online who asked some really great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. Um, Red, Campbell, Gareth, really a great conversation. My last thought is we should all think what legacy we wish to leave, hopefully from a professional industry perspective, we want to leave a good legacy that has a positive impact on patients. But um, I thank you all today. It's been terrific. Thank you. Thank you.